All right, this April Fool's Day, I think God did the best one ever. You know, give us snow and winter and everything else so we don't have to worry about me trying to be funny about things. So um, we're going to get right into the message. Um, there's a, 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 the scripture for today is powerful. There's all kinds of things going on. We could uh, like spend the whole year um, just kind of figuring out what all this means and, and the implications for our world and our life. But I want to I focus first upon these women uh, as they walk to the place where Jesus is buried, every thought that goes through their mind is kind of fuzzy. And every feeling that's going on in their hearts rather numb. They move along what I would perceive to be a narrow path, and it's in the dark because they're coming before the sun has uh, come up. Their arms are heavy carrying supplies, and they're not saying a word to one another. You see, they have a job to do when they arrive at the grave, and it's not a very pleasant job. They're responsible for finishing up the preparation of Jesus' body for proper burial. You see, on Friday when he died, the sun was beginning to set, and uh, because of the Sabbath laws and all, they weren't able to finish that task. So now they're back on Sunday morning. Now, the task is rather routine. It's not difficult for us to imagine that some of these women had done this before for other family members, maybe. But it's going to be difficult because there's so many tears in their eyes and there's such a deep emptiness in their hearts. It's just going to be hard to focus on even the most simple and routine things. You see, for them, when Jesus died three days before, their hope died, their joy died, their love died. These women are absolutely devastated. They're still having nightmares when they remember the whip ripping open the flesh on Jesus' back. They still cringe when they remember the crown of thorns punching holes into Jesus' face. They get nauseated again and again when they remember the pounding of the spikes into his wrist. And they shudder when they remember the gaping hole left by the sword thrust up under Jesus' ribs. But as hard as they try... Remembering all these other things, I'm not sure they're able to remember the final words of Jesus on the cross. Now, it's good because there are those who do, and they share that with the Apostle Luke. And Luke records those words, those last moments, and is found in Luke 23, verse 46. Luke writes this, Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now, those words can mean a lot of things, but in that moment for Jesus, they were about surrender, they were about joy, they were about incredible love. Now, it wasn't that way all through this crucifixion, because sometime before, there were moments when Jesus felt forgotten and forsaken by his heavenly Father. There were moments when Jesus felt that his heavenly father was pulling back from him or that his heavenly father was not listening to him or that his heavenly father wasn't going to help him. He felt that way while he was dying on the cross. So it would have been easy for Jesus to just give up on his heavenly father. But at the very end of those six hours when he's dying on the cross, Jesus is eager for a reunion with his heavenly father. You know, he knew, even when he was discouraged, even when he was afraid, even when he was sad, even when he felt all alone, Jesus still knew that his heavenly father loved him, would deliver him, and would hold him. So Jesus, in the moment in which he dies, says these few words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and then just like he falls into the arms of his heavenly father. In that moment, there is this reunion that happens between Jesus and his heavenly father. One of our daughters called a few months ago. I knew she had uh, come through a very challenging season, uh, four or five months long. There was a new job in a new city and a new apartment. There was a new church, a new small group, and new friends. But even with all of these new and good things, that's a lot of change to kind of navigate your way through. And all of that change had left her rather 
exhausted and empty. Well, as we visited on the phone, I asked her what she was going to do for the weekend, and she told me about her job and her church and her small group and, and a hike that she wanted to take. While she was describing the details of all of that, I heard a knock at the front door. Now, what was odd about that knock at the front door is this. I could hear the knock inside our house, but I could also hear the knock inside my phone. Curious what was going on. Our daughter had come home for the weekend, and she was talking to me on the phone when she got to the front door of the house. That was a pretty cool thing for us, and when we saw one another, she just kind of fell into my arms. There was nothing more that she wanted in that moment than to fall into her daddy's arms, to be loved, to be accepted, and to be held. She wanted reunion with her father. I imagine that's how Jesus felt as he gasped for his last breath and spoke his last few words. In that moment, all Jesus wanted was to fall into his father's arms, be drawn close to the father's heart, and to be held in the deep embrace of the Father's love. Jesus wanted reunion with his heavenly Father. Now let me ask you, isn't that all you want, really? Is to be loved? To be accepted for who you are? To be held in the presence of unconditional love? If so, then maybe our prayer is the same as Jesus' last prayer. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. After the other women leave, Mary lingers around the tomb of Jesus for a while. And while she's there, she engages in conversation with someone she believes that is the gardener or, or the caretaker of the place. Without thinking, she begins to realize that this is not a gardener, this is not a caretaker, this is Jesus, risen from death to life again. This is the risen Savior. And she just almost intuitively, instinctively, just begins to jump into the arms of Jesus because all she wants is the same that you and I want. She wants to fall into Jesus' arms. She wants to be drawn close to Jesus' love, and she wants to be held in the embrace of his heart. Now, Jesus tells her to wait just a minute because it's not quite the right timing for all of that, but the point is her desire is very clear. She's ready to fall into the arms of Jesus. Mary wants reunion with Jesus. So Jesus' last words from the cross and Mary's response at the empty tomb remind us that heaven is more than a place. I'm going to challenge you a bit here. Heaven is more than a place that we go when we die. Heaven is also a person in whose arms I want to be held. Jesus lived and died. And he was raised again to life. And because of that, we can experience union with Jesus in this life. But also because he lived and died and was raised again... We can have a reunion with him in the kingdom of heaven. It was several days before Jesus died that he told the disciples that he was going to pass soon, that he was going to die soon. And their hearts immediately fill with sadness and fear and loneliness. And Jesus responds to their grief by sharing with them a promise. And what Jesus promises is that heaven is a place and heaven is a reunion with a person. Let me read just one verse. It's John chapter 14, and it's verse number 3. Jesus describes heaven. I will come again and will take you to myself. Just before this, he said that heaven is a place with many rooms. Now he's saying that heaven is our reunion with Jesus. It's both. When you die. Jesus says, if you believe, you'll be re reunited with him. You see, the good news of Easter is that Jesus is alive. I don't have to wait until I die to be in relationship with Jesus. That can happen right now in my life. I can have that reunion right now. I can also have it when I die. 
So let me ask, do you know this kind of love, this kind of acceptance, this kind of grace that only Jesus can offer you? Do you know? I have a hunch that some of you opened your heart to Jesus a long time ago. You were there in his arms once, but you've slowly maybe drifted away a bit. Maybe you got a bit distracted or maybe you got a lot disappointed along the way. I'm here to tell you Jesus understands. He felt forgotten. and He felt alone. He felt uncertain. When that happens to you and me, it's very easy for us to look in places where there's really no hope or help or life. Today, Easter, is the day to stop looking in empty tombs and empty relationships and empty bottles and empty promises. Jesus says something to Mary as she stands outside of the tomb, and it's a word for us too. What he tells her is stop looking in the wrong places and look to me. Let me share it. It's Luke 24, verse 5. Why are you looking in the place of the dead for someone who is alive? She was looking in the wrong place. And how often do we look in the wrong place for the thing we desire most? The good news is Jesus is waiting for you. If you've drifted away a bit, he's waiting for you right now. And his arms are wide open for that reunion to happen. Now, some of you may have never opened your heart to Jesus. Maybe you've never fallen into our Heavenly Father's arms. Maybe you've never drawn close to Jesus' heart. Maybe you've never been held in the deep embrace of the Holy Spirit's power. But deep inside, you know there's something missing. There's a bit of an emptiness or a longing that is there. Whenever you get quiet long enough, you know it's there. And what the scripture says is that you're thirsting for more of God. Maybe Easter is the day that if we've drifted for a while, we can come back. Maybe if we've never opened our life to Christ, maybe Easter is the day that we can do that again. You see, I just want to invite you, be a little reckless today. Be a little reckless and just like Mary, just throw yourself at Jesus and just find yourself embraced in his love and in his grace. You see, reunion is waiting for you. So draw near, open your heart, surrender your will, give yourself to him, and then use Jesus' prayer as your prayer. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. All right, let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us your Son. You've given us all of your love. You've given us a part of yourself in Jesus. And then he chose to live and he chose to die. And then by the power of your love, you raised him from death to life again. And we're here to celebrate that reality, that hope today for each of us. Because what it means is that we can all have a glad reunion with the Son of God. Lord, we remember the night before Jesus died that he gathered with, with his disciples in a room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem and he shared the, the Passover meal with them. But in the midst of that meal, he lifted up some bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to you, Father, and then he said, eat this bread and when you do, remember my body which I'm going to give for you. And then he asked us to remember. A little later in that Passover meal, he lifted up a cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, Father. And then he said, I want all of you to drink this. And when you do, remember 
that this is about a new covenant. A covenant that is bought my, by my blood. And it's a covenant that's about forgiveness. And about coming into relationship with our Heavenly Father. So remember this. And so I pray this morning, Father, that as we share in the loaf and the cup, they may become for us the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And the forgiveness of sins so that we can experience this reunion with you, Jesus. So we ask for your blessings. We ask for your presence. In Christ's name, amen.